discussion. So um, I think without any further words uh, of delay, <laughs> we'll start with uh, Dr. Planiga, who's going to talk about writing a compelling problem statement. Thank you very much, yeah. Dr. Plantinga. So good morning, everyone. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm an associate professor um, in geriatrics and gerontology. Um, and I just wanted to thank Rachel Patzer, who's in Department of Surgery, um, who initially um, gave this lecture. So I borrowed some slides and content. So, um, so just to get started, the FAME program itself, um, and again, jump in if I say something wrong, um, it's designed to provide support for clinical fact of CE. So to be, in most cases, 100% clinical. Um, and it's to dedicate up to 20% of professional time to scholarly activity. Um, and this can be research, education, QI projects, or mentoring. Um, in 2023, um, there will be two awards, um, one supported by Department of Medicine and one supported by Geriatrics. Um, the review process is the same for everyone, um, but the two funding streams will come from these two sources. Um, so research pilot grants, um, so these will be granted to physicians who do not already have funded projects but wish to generate preliminary data to support extramural funding applications um, or to engage in other scholarly activity, including QI. Um, there are also teaching grants, and these are intended to support education-related activities to include um, activities such as developing or implementing a new curriculum, evaluating the outcomes of specific educational proposals, and developing innovative approaches to education or mentoring. Um, and it's not intended to support, obviously, routine clinical teaching time. Um, some deadlines. Um, so there is a required letter of intent, um, which is basically an email, it's not too much <laughs> um, effort. Um, it is due on January 31st. Um, this is a non-binding letter of intent, so if you don't know what that means, um, sometimes the letter of intent is, I'm going to submit this application and you are required to submit it. Um, and also sometimes it's, um, you have to receive permission from the funder to submit, um, that's not the case. This is just an informational um, letter of intent for um, us to know who is going to apply and what kinds of reviewers we need. So, um, and then the full application is due on February 27th, um, which might seem like it's a long way away, but it is not. So. <laughs> um, so just before I start, I'm mostly going to talk about research grants because that's what I do. Um, but most of this will apply to educational grants as well. Um, so before you start writing any grant, um, identify the problem. Um, and this should be a problem um, that's of great interest to you. Um, so not just your mentor or what you think the reviewers will like. Um, and this is because um, passion really counts. Um, you can kind of tell when somebody's really excited about a topic um, and that gets reviewers excited about it. Um, and then, you know, review the literature um, to identify gaps in the problem that you're interested in. Um, and then discuss your ideas to address these gaps with colleagues and mentors. So it's kind of, you know, this informational gathering phase, which hopefully you are in. Um, and then ensure mentor buy-in um, for any kind of mentored grant. Um, specifically for FAME, you also want to make sure that your division director is going to um, support it um, with a letter. Um, so you want to get that started soon if you haven't already. Um, and then another thing you should do is always read the grant announcement carefully. Um, so you want to identify potential fit. So make sure that you fit all the eligibility requirements and ask questions if you need to. Um, and then check for any special requirements for the grant, um, special sections, things like that. Um, and then if you're gonna have collaborators, you wanna choose collaborators and co-investigators with the experience or expertise um, that you may lack. Um, because this is a grant that doesn't really support co-investigators or staff, um, consider what you're asking them to do versus what you're offering them. Um, so people are generally willing to collaborate on something they're interested in and they think might lead to funding down the line, um, even if they're not going to get funded. Um, but just make sure that that your ask um, is about that. Um, this is a project that I'd like to get started. Um, you know, we think that this is going to lead to something. Um, so not just I need someone to be on this grant because um, people won't get excited about that. Um, if possible, for any kind of grant, obtain an example funded grant um, to see kind of how they laid out the grant. Um, really helpful. 
Um, so where to start, um, I would always start with a timeline to complete the proposal. So you have kind of your deadlines um, and then work backwards from that. Um, think about you know, how long it's gonna take to complete each session um, and try to stick to it <laughs> as much as possible. Um, don't forget other pieces of the grant. Um, so not just the science part of it. Um, so again, there's the letter of intent for fame specifically. Um, budget, um, not really applicable for the FAME grant, um, but thinking about other grants, um, you wanna do your budget first um, as you're kind of developing the science, just because it can affect the scope of the research. How much can you actually do for the amount that you have? Um, how many co-investigators can you afford? Um, can you afford staff? Things like that. Um, and then you wanna draft a problem statement um, or specific aims, um, whatever you call it, um, and circulate it to colleagues. So you kind of wanna get feedback just on the initial idea um, before you write the whole thing. Um, and then you're going to edit that, you're going to revise it, and you're gonna revise it again, probably after you write the whole science piece as well. Um, make sure that you provide enough time for anyone that you're asking to review this um, for substantive reviews and so not just kind of copy editing, which, if someone sends me a grant um, two days before it's due, they're going to get copy editing because I don't have time um, to kind of give um, uh, feedback on the content because I know that you won't have time to respond to that um, and make changes. So um, if you want that kind of review, um, make sure you give people plenty of time for that and build that into your timeline. So, um, so you should always think about the evaluation criteria as you're writing it. Um, what are the reviewers gonna be asked to do? So for FAME, um, the four criteria are the qualifications of the applicants. So you're gonna to wanna to talk yourself up. Um, goals and impact of your project. Um, identification of clear milestones, but because this is a very short grant, um, I think this is probably gonna be important um, to show that you're gonna be able to hit all of these. Um, and then support of an established mentor um, from School of Medicine, Department of Medicine, Grady, whatever. Um, so just make sure that in your grant that you've covered all of these. So when it comes to your problem statement or specific aims, um, this is your first chance to win over the reviewer. So it's really critical. Um, think about when you're reading something, you get more and more tired as you go. <laughs> so kind of first page you're reading, are you gonna hook those reviewers? Like this is a really important problem and I'm really rooting for this person um, as they read the grant. Um, so this will be the first thing you write. So this is what you're going to get feedback on, um, what will kind of drive the full grant. Um, and it'll also be the last section you finish because as you write the rest of the grant, you may find other details that you want to have in the aims. Um, so you want to include your major goals. Um, so you're going to want to convince the reviewer of the potential impact of your application. Um, and we'll talk about kind of local impact versus public health impact. Um, you're going to want to identify what the major gap is in the knowledge. So if you're not filling a gap, um, then people won't want to fund it. So you want to show um, there's something we still need to know about this um, and how your proposal specifically will address this gap. And you're going to detail short and long term objectives, which we'll talk about. Um, you're going to um, preview the approach. So it might just be this is going to be my study design. These are the data I'm going to use, um, just very short. Um, your outcomes, kind of your primary things you might be measuring, um, and your hypotheses. And then you're going to want to demonstrate feasibility within the proposed time frame. So again, with these short grants, you really have to um, kind of balance you're doing enough versus not <laughs> proposing way too much for one year, um, because if people don't think it's feasible, they're um, going to say so. Um, and then you're going to want to address specific goals from the funding announcement itself. Um, so as much as this may seem a little bit cheesy, um, you can even quote the announcement. I've done this many times. Um, just, you know, oh, this purpose of this grant um, is to fund projects that blah, 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 blah. And they have kind of, a, you know, overall goal um, that you can kind of say, this is how we're addressing this specifically with the quotes around it. Um, just because the reviewer, that will help the reviewer say you're um, hitting that funding announcement. So project impact. Um, so what is the clinical, um, educational and or public health um, significance and whether what type of project will determine what's most important? Um, as much as possible, um, communicate with numbers, um, you know, actually showing um, some data about the impact um, and citations. Um, you don't wanna just um, 
have numbers without <laughs> showing where they came from. Um, if you have incidents, um, prevalence data, it's kind of burden, outcomes data, utilization, cost, um, priority population. So maybe you have a rare disease, but it's children um, or um, things like that. Um, you want to make sure that you um, discuss all of those things. Um, and this is my epi training. You want to use absolute numbers um, rather than um, in addition to any relative measures. So um, instead of just saying population A is twice as likely as population B to develop X, that doesn't tell me how likely this is. Um, so if you have kind of 5% develop X um, or Y individuals develop X annually, um, that gives a little bit more information because you can be twice as likely with something that's one in a million, right? Versus one in a hundred. Um, so as much as possible, kind of describe the problem because the reviewers might not be in your field and know what the problem is. Um, for the FAME grant specifically, um, you're probably going to want to say what the Emory impact is as well, right? This is an internal grant. Um, so you're going to want to make sure that you show alignment with the missions of Emory School of Medicine, Emory Healthcare, um, VA, wherever um, you're working. So you can kind of look up what are the mission statements um, of what you're proposing, um, make sure that you address those as well. Um, so gap in knowledge, I talked about, we're going to want to say we have a gap and we're um, filling it. So you want to summarize any relevant literature. Um, if you have any of your own work, you could um, highlight it here. Um, it's not necessary. Um, you can summarize other people's work. Um, and it doesn't have to be a systematic review. So it doesn't have to be every article <laughs> about this. Um, just kind of the, the literature that supports the points that you're making. Um, and again, assume reviewers are not in your field um, and will not know what the issues are. Um, and then point out the critical component that's needed to move the field forward. Um, set up the gap so it's obvious that your next step is to conduct specifically the research that you are proposing. <laughs> um, why this specifically? Um, for your objectives, the reviewers and funders want to see that you have a plan for long-term success. So if the project is successful, um, what is the next step? Um, so this is where you get into kind of short-term versus long-term. So you're going to want to talk about short-term objectives. So that's what you will accomplish with this grant. And again, it's one year, so it's not going to be a lot, um, but you want to make sure that you show that. Um, but you also want to talk about what your long-term objective is. So kind of what's the long view here? Um, what are you going to do over the next 5, 10, 20 years? Um, and how the successful completion of these aims will address that and move you toward that goal. Um, for aims, you want to convert your question into actionable aims, the things you can actually do, um, and that reflect your approach. Um, they should be clear and brief. Don't make them too long. Um, people will lose the thread. <laughs> Um, so typically one to three sentences, um, usually two to three aims for grants. Um, keep your one year time frame in mind. Um, so if you have three aims, make sure they're very short. <laughs> um, and then you can include objectives or sub aims within that if they fit. Um, your aims should be related. Um, people always say don't have your aims related or dependent on one another. There are kind of ways around this, um, which I'll show you with the example. Um, but just thinking about, you know, if one aim fails, making sure you can still do the other aims again, or at least have a plan for how they will be completed um, if the initial aims fail and communicate that. So an example, and again, this is from um, Dr. Patzer. Um, so this is a grant she wrote on, um, she writes all of her grants on kidney transplant disparities, um, but, um, just showing kind of her background. So she starts with this sentence, kidney failure is a substantial public health burden, shows how many people have chronic kidney disease and how many people are dialysis dependent. And these are old data, it's more than 500,000 now. Um, and then um, then she starts talking about kind of what, what are the gaps? So we know the transplant's better than dialysis for a lot of patients, but um, there's a large gap between those who need a transplant and the number of organs we have. You know, this constraint has resulted in disparity. So um, even though, you know, everybody has trouble getting a transplant, some people have more trouble than others, and it's based on race and socioeconomic status. Um, and then um, she gets into kind of, it's people not being informed of kidney transplantation as an option at the start may be part of the problem of why we see these racial disparities. Okay, so this first sentence, it's establishing a public health importance of the problem. 
um, you know, not a lot of people. Um, she could have added things like how expensive it is <laughs> that, you know, I don't know how much space she had, um, that dialysis is more expensive than transplant, things like that. Um, so kind of thinking about your audience, what'll, what will they think is most important? Um, and then she talks about kind of the current gaps. Um, so, you know, we don't have enough organs, there are disparities in who gets the organs, and maybe that's because of um, being informed of kidney transplant. Okay, and then she starts going toward her goals. So in this proposal, we'll develop and evaluate the feasibility of a novel shared patient provider decision support tool um, to optimize translation of evidence into terms understandable to patients. Um, and then says she's expected um, that the proposed study will lay the foundation for a subsequent trial to test the clinical efficacy of a decision support tool in a high disparities dialysis population. Um, and then talks about the translational aspects of it, which was probably part of the grant language. Um, and so you can see she has her short-term goal. So here's what I'm going to accomplish just with this grant. Okay, and then she has a long-term goal and next step. So she's going to take this, um, potentially do a trial, get external funding for that, um, and kind of move this um, field forward that way. Okay, and then she had her aim. So her first aim was to develop the support tool. Um, to communicate risks, um, and she did have three objectives under that, which might be a bit much for the short grant, but um, so she talks about developing the predictive models that will feed into it um, for the options of dialysis, deceased donor, and living donor, um, and then develop and validate, and then translate them into decision support tool. Um, this would be a lot to do in one year, so just <laughs> that up. Um, but I think she had some prior um, data. Okay, um, and then her aim too is to determine the feasibility of implementing that. So it's not to determine the efficacy, it's to determine, you know, can we actually do this in the clinic? Um, so that will give them data on how to conduct the trial um, that she's proposing in later times. So this is an example where aim, um, the aim two is dependent on aim one. So they need to develop the tool to be able to assess its feasibility. Um, but I think because this was a feasibility study and not effectiveness, it's probably okay. Um, but just make sure that you explain um, what you will do if the first thing doesn't happen, um, if you have aims like this. Um, so this is actually a fame grant example. Um, so in this case, looking at um, GERD, um, so it talks about the, the first statement is importance of the problem stated in quantitative terms. So two in five people have GERD, um, which is really high. <laughs> Um, and a lot of people don't respond to PPIs, okay? Um, so it starts getting into the gap. Um, so um, the specific gap they're trying to address um, is that current diagnostic methods are um, burdensome, inaccessible, and costly um, when PPIs fail. Okay, um, and then um, they added some preliminary data to suggest feasibility um, stated in quantitative terms. So. Um, it provide the sensitivity um, of this method, which I don't know what it is, um, is shown to be as high as 97%. Okay. And then they get into their aims. So they provide an overall central hypothesis and overarching goal, right? So they have their short-term goal of the grant and then their overarching goal. Um, so kind of want to develop this, you know, we have this less costly, less burdensome method of diagnosis. Um, and then they have a specific hypothesis for um, how it will go. Um, and then, you know, they'll test these hypotheses with these aims, so the short-term goals. So they're going to test, whatever FLIP is, um, as a modality for diagnosis um, and comparing it to kind of these high-resolution manometry and gold standard barium esophagram. Um, and then they're going to assess the response to um, botulin toxin okay, um, in different subtypes. So these are specific addressable aims to test um, their stated hypothesis. Um, and just as a side note, watch your abbreviations because I totally lost the train of what they were talking about. Um, because again, I'm not in this field, right? Um, so they're not gonna be familiar with all of these. So as much as possible, write out things. I know we have a lot of terms. Um, just make sure you kind of repeat abbreviations every few pages because people will forget. So um, feasibility. So make sure that what you want to do um, or are proposing to do fits within the time frame. So again, it's only one year. Um, talk to people who have done research and talk about what you can actually do in one year. Um, maybe be a little bit ambitious, um, but not something um, 
things take a lot longer than you think all of them um, within research. Um, establish your feasibility for actually doing the study with any preliminary data. Again, don't have to be yours. Um, demonstrating any prior experience, um, the experience of your mentor team, or just a feasible approach. And again, don't have to be your data. Um, and then note for FAME research grants specifically, um, go ahead and apply for the IRB when you submit your grant. Um, it's okay if you never use it, <laughs> but IRB is slow. Um, and because these projects start in September, you kind of want to have this in place. You don't want to have the first three months of your grant being waiting for the IRB to approve your project. So, um, so some common pitfalls. Um, in grants, um, especially FAME grants. So lacking a succinct description of the current state of the evidence. So again, we saw that in the two examples and what the gap in knowledge or practice um, that creates the critical need for the proposed project. Um, the proposal is overly ambitious in terms of scope. So again, you wanna make sure it's something you can do in a year. Um, it can't com be completed within the time frame or with the effort or team proposed. Maybe you're proposing something that requires a lot of personnel. Um, which you know you may not have because this covers your effort and not that. Um, and then kind of a lack of clear experience in the subject area by the applicant. So this is another reason to pick something that you're passionate about um, and that you've kind of worked in. Um, and then unclear institutional support for the project. So um, making sure that the letter from your division director is very um, strong. Um, so if relevant, um, not including a clear statistical analysis plan. Um, you don't have to have all of the details, but um, that you know how you're going to do it. Um, and um, not including a discussion of strategies to overcome potential barriers to achieving goals. Um, so if you don't have this, um, and often people have kind of a section of, you know, potential barriers and alternative approaches. Um, but not having something like that um, suggests to the reviewers that you might not even recognize what those barriers are. It's better to kind of say, I know that these things could happen. Maybe my recruitment won't go as well as I think, or, um, you know, I won't be able to get, you know, a certain set of data that I wanted to link to this. And so instead I'll do this if that happens. Um, that's much better to do than kind of not acknowledge that there may be things that could happen. Um, and then a lack of a clear mentoring plan with an experienced <clears throat> mentor. So aim for at least kind of monthly meetings with a mentor, make sure that you state that that's what is happening. Okay, um, so some example reviewer comments. This is from one of my grants. Um, <laughs> hopefully they won't be as mean as NIH reviewers, but um, you know, um, so it starts off well, um, but then um, you can see they're saying, you know, it's not significant sufficiently explain the problem um, and how the report solves that problem. So they're not convinced that I'm addressing a true gap, which kind of tanked the whole grant, right? Um, so you can kind of see um, once they're not hooked from the beginning, um, there, um, we'll just keep criticizing. Um, so this is, um, you know, in NIH, they have various categories. Um, so this was a significant section. Um, and um, just say that reviewers are human um, and they do kind of have biases. Um, and this is what we call criteria bleed. So the reviewer is criticizing my approach. Um, so they don't like that I'm not doing a trial, um, but they're applying it to the significance of the problem, which is a different issue, um, right? Um, so it's more of an approach problem. So even a strong problem statement might not be enough. Um, it's just making sure each part of your grant is strong. Um, so, um, and making sure you're, you hook them from the beginning. Um, so just some general tips for success. Um, so follow the instructions. Um, so <laughs> may seem small, NIH will kick back a grant that doesn't have 0.5 inch margins. Um, so things like that will um, tank you, I'm not sure so much with the FAME grant, but just you know, get in the habit of following all the instructions. Um, always get a copy of a funded grant um, for your target mechanism if you can. Um, with NIH, you can kind of go on NIH Reporter and see um, what other people have submitted. Um, you won't be able to see the whole grant, but um, kind of how they approach different mechanisms. Um, be familiar with the review criteria, which I listed earlier in this talk, because um, you want to address each of those and make sure it's very clearly um, noted um, so that the reviewers don't have to search for it when they go to review. Um, avoid abbreviations as much as possible. Again, it's not, can't avoid all of them, but 
um, just keep in mind that people are not in your field. Um, so try to get into the mind of the reviewer. It'd be hard to do. Um, this is why it's good to get someone else to read your grant. Um, but just when I say this, I say keep in mind that they may not be experts in your field. Um, and I say might be, they probably are very tired. <laughs> um, we're all, you know, very busy. Um, so, you know, when I first started writing grants, I was worried um, that it was being condescending if I explain things. Um, don't worry about that. Like err on the other side of, you know, over explaining things rather than um, not um, because we just, you know, we're all in our little fields and um, yeah. So again, err on the side of over explaining. Um, again, colleagues who are not in your field um, or involved in the project can provide feedback on this. Um, so I know you kind of assigned like a writing mentor. Um, that would be a good person to um, do this for you. Okay, um, so have your mentor review the grant in detail. Make sure you give them enough time to do so. Um, sure you proofread. So this is kind of more for copy editing type of issues. Um, but consider, you know, if there's a lot of grammatical errors or spelling errors. Um, that will get the reviewer distracted and you don't want that to happen. Um, all of these things require time, so don't start too late. So start now if you haven't already. Um, and then don't let um, what we call analysis paralysis set in. So you're kind of thinking about how to do things and, oh, it's not going to be perfect if I do it this way. And, um, and then you're not doing anything. Um, just start writing. <laughs> okay. um, and remember, perfection is the enemy of the good. There will never be a perfect grant. I've submitted grants and seen like immediately the typo on the first page when I submitted it and like, it's okay. Um, it's, you know, it's never gonna be perfect, um, but you want a good project. Um, and then in terms of um, kind of the review process, so develop a thick skin, this, you know, easier said than done. Um, but just know that everyone, including me, gets rejected all the time. <laughs> so most of my grants are rejected. Um, I don't get most of the grants that I apply for. Um, you get a lot of comments that you have to read through and um, they might not be very nice, but <laughs> one thing to do is kind of, you know, get the comments, sit on them for a while and then go back and read them um, when you're not quite as upset about the rejection and get what you can that's constructive out of that um, to rewrite it. Um, and you can ignore things that are not constructive. Um, so some writing don'ts. Um, so limit your adverbs, you can use them. Um, but you know, if every sentence has, this is remarkably, extremely, really, um, it starts to seem a little much. Um, um, make sure that you um, avoid vague wording. So saying something like there were substantial differences. Well, how substantial, how big was it? Um, was it statistically significant? I don't know. Um, so make sure that you're, you're very specific. Um, don't use, and this is again, an epi thing, statistical terms use colloquially. So people will say significantly improved um, when they don't mean statistically significant, or if you do mean statistically significant, say that. Um, so again, just be very um, clear. Avoid excessive abbreviations. I know I've said it three times, but it's important. Um, so don't use big words when simpler words will do. So we all know we're all very smart and have all gotten doctoral degrees and know a lot of words, um, but um, it can, it's better to be clear um, than to use, um, you know, you don't have to go to the thesaurus and keep looking up synonyms for words. Um, this is my thing. I can't stand a grant that has no white space, um, but this is a personal thing. Um, so just kind of spaces between paragraphs, even like the little, like a little six point um, white space between paragraphs helps with kind of the readability because if I look at a page that's just all words I'm like Ugh. that makes me dread reading the page um, so just a little bit of space um, can be helpful um, some do's so again clarity number one um, you can keep your sentences short they don't have to be long um, and I'm very guilty of very long sentences so <laughs> people are always shortening mine um, Use active voice when you can. It's not always possible. Um, just make sure it's not every sentence is passive voice because that can be boring to read. Um, when you can incorporate figures and tables. Um, so again, it's like the white space issue. Like it breaks up the, um, the page, um, makes the reader a little bit more excited to read it. Um, they can see something visually that maybe was hard to explain in words um, or took too many words to explain. And then proofread. Um, and you can have someone else do that for you. And again, um, you want people to review and provide critical comments and leave enough time. And it's another thing I've said three times, but 
<laughs> it does take time. Um, and that was all I had. So hopefully we have time for discussion and questions. Thank you very much, Laura. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll open it up to the group to see if there's any questions for uh, Dr. Plantinga. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Hi, I'm Catherine Park. I'm one of the docs um, at uh, Midtown in General Medicine. Um, I'm very, very new to this whole process. Um, and my mind keeps thinking about these grant proposals in terms of a, a research project, you know, with um, that kind of goal in mind, but I'm probably more leaning towards a, a QI kind of project. So I'm trying to figure out like what the difference would be in that kind of proposal. Um, like, do you have to still produce data or an endpoint with that QI project? Um, I mean, I'd say with QI, you still have to produce an endpoint. Um, I think kind of the difference between QI and research um, is research is definitely leading further along. So QI is to fix a problem that's happening right now, right? Um, so you want the data, you want to collect data to show um, that you're doing mm -hmm. that as part of the grant. Um, you know, so I that's tricky in terms of the long-term versus short-term goals, just because QI is usually not geared toward long-term goals. Um, obviously, it's to kind of improve quality of care. Um, you know, you learn something from the QI project for the next QI project. Um, I don't know if anybody else has thoughts on that. Um, I'm not a QI person, so. Um. Yeah, I mean, um, the QI, the, you are addressing a gap or some sort of um, need, and you make that clear. And then um, you have, objectives or aims for the for the QI project and then you would describe obviously you describe the background for this and then um you know what what steps you would take to do your assessment or do your um analysis and and then what would be the implications of the of your study or your project mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, most of the implications would be local, right? Because um, it's a QI project, so it's what's going to happen in my clinic um, if this is successful. Um, yeah, I think the trickiest thing is kind of that long-term goal piece. Um, I would just make it very clear as you're writing it. Just keep saying quality improvement over and over again <laughs> so the reviewers don't forget and start reviewing it as a research project because um, you don't want to get critiques for that um, when you're not right. doing research. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, this is Anand Shah. Um, I'm at the VA. And so uh, my question is kind of uh, similar to Catherine. So again, in the QI vein, as far as methodology goes, again, it's PDSA cycles, but as far as your interventions go, you're not going to know it right now until, again, you're in the thick of it. So, I mean, as far as methodology go, short of saying you're going to be performing PDSA cycles, is there going to be more of an expectation as far as methodology goes or um, do you want more as far as information on yes we're going to be doing you know con controlled run charts or um, like how we're going to analyze those PSAs you know Pareto charts that that sort of thing um, mm -hmm. I think it'd be helpful to have sort of an example of a, a QI grant um, yeah, I don't know if we have an example of a QI fame grant that could be shared. Um, um, but in general, I think even for QI or for research, um, you want to, you know, show that you know how you're going to approach something. I'm not sure how much detail there is, um, and it's a fairly short grant. Um, and I think with any grant that we write, we're not entirely certain what we're going to do. We don't know every statistical model we're going to run, um, but you want to have kind of, you know, if I'm doing logistic regression, like this is probably going to be a logistic regression problem. Um, and then maybe for my, you know, anticipated barrier, well, maybe I'm going to have missing data and how am I going to deal with that? Um, so just, you know, I think you can say what your anticipated methods would be. Um, any kind of what if this doesn't work, this is what we'll do. Um, yeah, but I don't think you have to have every, you know, 
I've never seen it in a grant. These are the models we're going to run, and um, because you you don't know until you collect the data. Um, I mean, you want to have enough detail to to convince the reviewer that you thought about mm -hmm. what you need to do. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, broadly, you know, you can state what you need to do, but within that broad, you know, assessment, you need to um, provide information that will convince the reviewer that you can do it. Mm -hmm. And that means that in this case, I think it means that you've thought about different possibilities. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this is a tricky part of grants, even for those of us who've been writing them a long time, is how much detail to provide. And um, because we know that things don't always go the way you think. In fact, rarely go the way you think. So. <clears throat> other questions? <laughs> Any other questions uh, about the writing the grant and or the sort of uh, mechanics of the FAME process here? The FAME grant process. So you, um, I believe most of this group will be, have coaches or have been assigned coaches. Um, and uh, hopefully you've set up a meeting with your coach or is that that's correct right sarah <laughs> yes <laughs> that's uh, so on, yes, that sarah. the the onus of that is on the uh grant uh, oh. submitter right okay so we're getting a question about the selection process and how many applicants get the grant um i don't know if you want to talk about like who reviews the grants um how long that sure. and, yeah. <laughs> um, so Dr. Planiga, I think outlined mm -hmm. at the beginning of her talk that there are two grants um, that are going to be awarded. Uh, one through ger geriatrics and gerontology and the other from the Department of Medicine. So obviously, um, the geriatrics grant would be for someone who's in someone in geriatrics. <laughs> uh, and then the rest would be competing for that one um, Department of Medicine grant. And the reviewers is uh, are um, um, me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm one of the reviewers, but there's also um, uh faculty who have been working with this program for several years including um camille vaughn uh who was um i guess i'm not supposed to really say who the grant reviewers are <laughs> right but um it's it's basically senior faculty senior investigators who have had experience with the fame grants themselves so they've seen mm -hmm. fame grants over the years um and I don't know. Does that does that address your question? And you know, they're they're in on the website, and I think Sarah has emailed you. There's uh, certain criteria for how the grant should be structured, and what um, what the review criteria are. And and Dr. Planiga has basically gone through a lot of that today. Mm -hmm. And just make sure you're always really clear in your sentences. <laughs> what criteria you're addressing, um, because it does make it easier for the reviewer. They don't have to search through your grant. Where did they say, like, I have qualifications or where did they say, um, you know, where there's, where their mentor support is and just make sure you have all of that very clearly laid out. And I think if you follow the, the format, um, you'll be able to do that. So. I mean, I would say that you, um, generally you have two reviewers for each grant and then they get together we get together after you know all the grants have been submitted and the whole group it's like uh you know eight or ten of us i think discuss all of the grants but the review the the two there's two primary reviewers they they kind of present the grant and then the group discusses it and um 
which is typical format of a review panel, a review study section uh, that you would see like at the NIH or, you know, um, the American Gastrointestinal Society or, you know, the, any of these mm -hmm. big organizations that fund. Mm -hmm. But you discuss all of them, right? You don't do that. Yeah, no, they're all discussed. There's no triage <laughs> process. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the, every every grant gets discussed. And you know, the criteria that some of the important criteria that um, I would, you know, sort of highlight here is um, what Dr. Planiga has <laughs> pointed out <laughs> that mentor. Um, that mentor letter is is pretty important um, because it's obviously we understand that um, the applicant has limited um, experience with submitting grants or doing a research project, but we really want to see that the mentor is invested or committed to this uh, project. Mm -hmm. So yeah, make sure yeah you, you need that yeah. you need that letter should be yeah. you know yeah. um, <laughs> convincing us that they're going to support mm -hmm. uh, intellectually at least the the project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, make make sure the letter matches what you say in your grant too, because that that's a red flag if it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Sorry, I, I may have missed something. So there's a mentor letter and then there's also um, a division director letter. Yeah, the division director letter is um, it's just a short statement saying that they would, have, you know, they would um, adhere to the fame guidelines mm -hmm. as far as supporting you while you're doing your project mm -hmm. okay so two separate letters yeah mm -hmm. i mean the the division letter is quite is is in general brief the division director whereas the mentor letter should be a little more involved mm -hmm. or mentor statement I, I mean i guess it's a letter but it's mm -hmm. it's kind of a statement yeah Thank you. And does the mentor have to be part of the School of Medicine? For instance, mm. if it's QI, can it be like a, a QI scholar in the School of Nursing, for instance? Like uh, it does not have to be a Department of Medicine or School of Medicine. That's correct, Sarah, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, we're more concerned with you being in the Department of Medicine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, we're, we're available offline, I guess, or outside this time, if you have any questions or uh, concerns that you want to address, want to address. So um, I don't know if we had a question, somebody unmuted. Um, well, hi, I'm Megan. I, I work with Dr. Park at Emory MOT as well. I wanted to clarify regarding the mentors, would it make most sense to pick a mentor who's a expert in the field? versus someone who has extensive research experience. For example, I, I'm thinking about applying for the teaching grant portion and I have several, a team of mentors I was exploring. Um, a few of them are experts in the field versus a few of them have more experience in developing curriculum. I'm not sure I completely understand the distinction. <laughs> um, 
the the mentor ideally would be someone who um you know has done the kind of work that you're proposing to do uh is an established you know person in that field and um has the bandwidth time uh enthusiasm to support your project okay mm -hmm. So if they're doing an educational project, it wouldn't necessarily have to be a researcher. It would be somebody who's got a lot of experience in education. Yeah, exactly. Right. So I, I had, I was thinking of someone who's developed curriculum already, um, but they're not necessarily in, um, they haven't developed curriculum for what I'm, I want to do. Yeah. I mean, that sounds appropriate. Okay. Um, because they have, um, you know, they're established. They seem to like they're they've been established in this field, the curriculum development field. I guess. The okay, got it. Mm -hmm. um, I had a question about the the funding. So um, I'm 100% VA, paid through the VA. Um, how does that work as far as the 20% um, <laughs> funding? Uh, can that money be used towards something else? I know that gets a little complicated. That's yeah, just... it does get complicated. On, on, um, we get you the money uh, or provide you the access to these funds and you there is um, some discretion on how you use the funds. Okay. Um, I mean, you know, we had the one, someone like the Jason Lineski was a fame recipient this past year. And um, I think he, he was doing a project that required um, that he pay for access to a certain amount of uh, data. And I, th I think we supported, you know, use the fame funds to support that, that part of it. That's not, that's, that's really just for the VA though, right? That's not for um, Emory um, faculty. I mean, full-time Emory faculty. So in other words, for the other faculty, they, they don't really have, I mean, you're in a unique situation because your salary is completely paid for by the VA. So. Um, right, okay. I hope, I uh, hope I haven't. Well, like for I haven't messed that up, have I, Sarah? Yeah, no, yes, yes, you're correct, Charlie. <laughs> okay, so I could use that money. I will have access to that money to to use towards the project, and so I guess to to in considering the budgetary part of the proposal, is that a consideration? Um, to kind of. But no, I wouldn't worry or, about that. I okay. we 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 deal with that after you get awarded. Okay. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> Anon, you don't have you don't have any effort at other. You're just 100% VA, right? Yep, 100%. Okay. Yeah. I had a quick question. Uh, this is Dr. Stolten from the Department of Geriatrics. And I was just wondering, um, due to clinical commitments, I know FAME Grant um, has one, a one investigator that they're awarded to, but due to clinical constraints, if there's, there's two people from the same division who would like to pursue this, is that even a possibility? <laughs> Yes. Yes. We, we, we can take. We can take oh. <laughs> Anyone else hearing an echo? <laughs> I was, but not now. <laughs> uh, yes, we do take more than one application per division. Um, it just one person will in that division will be granted the specific division funded grant. So two people from geriatrics, as an example, could receive both the DOM funded grant and the geriatrics. Does that make sense? Oh, yes, yes. So, but, but let's say, you know, because again, I, this is new to me, I'm clinical and, uh, you know, there is, um, if there is 
if I find another person who, you know, we are, we're both trying to, or if I find somebody who is more experienced and, you know, they are, they're willing to collaborate. So, but for the same proposal, that's what my question is. Oh, kind of like a multi- Multi-PI. Is, is this, yeah. the, is this <laughs> yeah. the person? Uh, so I guess we're kind of piloting multi-PIs. Oh, are core PI yeah. more than the multi <laughs> Like just due to time constraints, you know, clinical clinical duties, time constraints, lack of experience, you know, multiple. <laughs> well, I mean, this is the whole this is the whole goal of the Fame program, though, is to give you some uh, protected time so that you can develop into so you can gain the experience. Mm -hmm. And the and then, getting getting the signature and the approval from your division director is basically that stamp that you will mm -hmm. be reduced on your clinical time uh, by 20% to focus on your research project. Got it, got it. But it couldn't be like 10, 10, you know, split it between the two people. Um, I mean, I would say you probably need that 20% to complete a project. So I don't know if I would recommend that. Like, okay. <laughs> Sorry for this yeah. complicated. So uh, <laughs> we are actually having this discussion with another. Sarah, is it's another investigator? It's, yes, we yeah. received the same question from another pair, uh, and so we're we've been talking about. Mm. Um, so, so the demand is there. I see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I. It's interesting that you're not that person, right? I guess it, it was. <laughs> Yeah. Um, we have, we, there's a meet. we have a meeting today. We're going to discuss, probably discuss this issue further. Mm -hmm. I mean, I you know, the, the, uh, <clears throat> some of the conversation so far has been, we would, we would be concerned. I think Dr. Planning, just brought this up is that is 10% enough for you to get that experience to launch you to the next grant or to, to get, to get you going. And that's part of the goal of this pro of this fame process is to to um, help you sort of learn how to start doing this stuff so you become an investigator. And I'm going to be very honest here. So I know I'll be I'll be spending more time than twenty percent. I, I even if I do, you know, I know that as you know, it's and it's going to be my it's going to be my own time. But yeah. my my barrier right now is. A lack of like I said lack of experience but the desire is there to launch because I've been clinical 100% clinical FTE so the desire is there but there is no way I can I'm trying to step into the research world but I feel because of I don't have the lack of it uh, the, because of the experience is not there and then you know I need to I need to start but I I'm finding a pathway so again, um, you know, I know that it'll be more than 20% of the time for sure. So even, even if you say, it, I know it's a discussion at the table, but whoever gets it, I'm pretty confident they spend more than 20% of the time, you know, <laughs> working on these projects, so. Um, you're gonna meet with Dr. Turbo. Sorry? Yeah, I see that your coach is Dr. Turbo. Yes. Uh, can you, maybe you have a discussion with her about this uh, uh, mm -hmm. as far as, Sarah has been a FAME recipient, right? Maybe uh, not. I'm not sure if she's been a FAME recipient. I know she currently has a career development award. Mm -hmm. So she's working um, and works closely with her mentor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you... Uh, would you mind having this, uh, having a brief discussion with her about this with her, and then um, we'll we we can touch base with Dr. Turbo and sort of reassess. Okay, well, that sounds good. <laughs> Seed of hope. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, like I said, the concern is. Um, Will you get enough out of ten percent? I know. I know you're saying you're going to do much more than ten percent, but um, you know what? Uh, what would be the benefit above having you as the sole person? 
And then the, the question is for a co, it's not just going to be me. I've obviously partner with another, um, you know, a faculty who's interested. Yeah, um, that's what we're talking about. We're basically talking about what we call a multi PI proposal. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And okay. in theory, those proposals, you know, the, 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 the responsibility for completing the project are falls on both. Yes. Equally. Right. And then I, they would each only have 10% to do it. So like each one doesn't have the full time to do it. So I don't know. I have one quick question before we uh, finish up. Hi, Elena Cab. Um, as a junior faculty, I haven't found an area of, you know, expertise, obviously, but there are interests like education and um, just uh, advanced care planning um, for geriatrics. And I'm wondering, do we, do you recommend us utilizing our coach to find that, that area? Like I want, I have a few ideas, but I don't know what, which direction to go in, where the need is. And so that's when I there you keep saying write a draft, write it up. Well, I don't know yet, but I know I want to do something. So it, I'm just so it's in all these ideas are in their infancy. Where where do I get guidance on um, how how to proceed? Well, I mean, so two two, two places I would say or I would advise. Uh, one is the co yeah, the coach is appropriate to have this discussion with, and then. Do you have a mentor or somebody that you, um, you know, a, a senior, more senior person who, I guess it, the, in part, that depends on which direction you go. I, is that the idea here? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's worth having that first conversation with your coach, um, okay. which is uh, Dr. Perkins. Yeah, I'm supposed to have a draft to her for by today, and I'm like, I I don't. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I think you have this. You got to have that conversation. <laughs> but then immediately, you know, I think you should. You need to differentiate soon, like yeah. mm -hmm. uh, by tomorrow, <laughs> or you know, very soon. And then, um, then I would start having that conversation with a mentor. The mentor might say, "Look." Um, you know, I don't think this is possible or something like that. So um, that could also be a determining factor here. Mm -hmm. But I think it's worth having a conversation with Dr. with Dr. Perkins here. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Okay, well, we're out of time anyway. So um, we have another session next Friday at the same time, eight o'clock, mm -hmm. which will be uh, Dr. Mehta, um, who uh, for the topic is uh, more, about, more, yeah, more about the nuts and bolts of writing the grant. Mm -hmm. And um, I really strongly encourage everyone who's left <laughs> the one left in this 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 zoom to um to meet with your coaches mm -hmm. and if you if you want i guess and uh i want to thank again laura uh planting up for this it's a great talk i mean it's a very informative and um timely so thank you very much mm -hmm. thank you thank feel you. free to email me if you have questions so yeah we're we're here for questions continuously thank you Thank you. <laughs>